do know is that um, the question is this, that if you are in a higher grade, will you be able to influence, is that what you're saying, this world more? Yes. yes. Well, this is what Baha'u'llah says to us. He's, he's, he's not talking of the influence of those he says the holy souls, in his writings, he talks about the influence of the holy souls in this life is so great that it can uh, produce all the arts and sciences in this life and uh, become the cause of growth. It is obviously from the holy souls that, will be, uh, that this will happen. But again, you see, these are only, as I said, our own limited, very, very limited understanding of the realities and the truths. We shall know it in the next life fully what's happening. Yes? Sorry? Sorry, I couldn't hear what... Could somebody tell me? Because it's, I can't hear it from there. She said, can parents aid in the growth oh, yes. of the soul? Of course. You know, um, there again, we, are, we, write, we, we, we hear in the writings that... Uh, in the writings that uh, prayer, through prayer, the souls of those who passed away can, can progress through the instrumentality of prayer, through the instrumentality of some um, charity work in the name of your children, in the memory of whoever it is, in the service that you yourself render to the cause, all of these things will aid uh, the souls who are passed on to progress. And I, I will want to mention this to you, that... Um, when we, we uh, people who have come uh, from the East, like myself, not nowadays, but in the old days, uh, there was a very clear uh, attitude about oneself. And that was that I am not an important person that I do not ever celebrate my own birthday. I'll just give you an example of it. Nobody in my time, when I was young, in, those, in, the, in the East, would ever consider, consider even, or dream of, or think about that I have to celebrate my birthday. They considered that they were so insignificant that you don't consider, you don't celebrate yourself. The only person's birthday which was worthy of celebration was that of a prophet. That's when it's a holy day. And so, there was never such a thing as uh, doing this because they considered this will um, create an ego growing and uh, e egotistical attitude of turning to yourself and becoming a center of attraction or center of attention on your birthday. Well, I'm not saying that anything against birthday. Uh, don't mistake it now. I'm not saying you can do what you like. I'm just mentioning to you that this was the attitude. But, instead of that, instead of celebrating your birthday, they always commemorated one of their dear ones who had passed away and would pray for him on the anniversary of his passing. So that the anniversary that you could have was that of your passing. When you passed, your family would sit and would pray for you on the anniversary, would invite their friends to come together on that evening, on that day, in, in memory of that person. And then they would pray for him. They considered this was much better than celebrating your own birthday. Because then your soul will progress as a result of the prayers of yourself and your friend. Now who knows how these things will adjust themselves in the future. The more we pay attention to ourselves. Now, now I don't want you to go around and say I've said something against holding your birthday. Well go on and do it as much as you want. And... Uh, blow all the candles and all the things you do. <laughs> but uh, all I'm saying is, uh, nothing to do with birthdays, but what I'm saying is that the attitude should be that of not playing up our ego, but playing it down. 
to subdue our ego, which we were talking about last night somehow. You cannot destroy it, you must not kill it. Because if we do that, we are not, uh, we can't live in this life. You have to have yourself. You have to have, uh, this is part of you. You can't, but it is a very dangerous animal. A self and ego. And when it comes out, you, all you have to do is to put a rein on it and hold it in your hand and control it. Um, probably we will mention a little bit about that. I'll make a note of it to, to bring this matter up later on. Now, any other questions here that you can, uh, you want to talk about what so far we've said? If not, then we'll go. Yes? Well, I'll answer the second question because it's e easier to de deal with it this way. You see, this world we are having is the world of relativity. Everything in relation to something else. And therefore, um, uh, you come across shadows and lights because everything is relative. Uh, even a bad man, as you call him, he's very good in relation to another man who is worse than him, you see? So things are relative. And uh, there is darkness and there is light. But Abdul Baha mentions, he says, if you were living in the sun, there would be no day and no light. No, no day and no night. It would be, everything would be uh, still. And in the next life, there is no, this is not a world of relativity, it's the world of the absolute. You see now? So that nothing will, uh, will emerge from that world, will radiate except good. And... Uh, this is my understanding from the writings and looking at nature. But whether despair is a lack of confidence, these are matters which um, we don't want to split hair. Now, if you think it is, all right. Oh, in the next world, you mean? No, oh, no. Yeah, no, no, not. We are talking. I thought you meant in this life. No, no, no. no. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. In the yeah, yeah. No, in the next life, you can see everything is positive, and despair is not there. They cannot have despair in the spiritual worlds of God. You see, it is all confidence and all positive qualities. Everything is positive. Yes, everything, every little bit of good. It is good. It's like having one dollar with you. Well, one dollar is money. It's just like hundred dollars, except it is less in value, but it is of the same quality. You know. I think that uh, we cannot uh, understand, you must always realize that what we are doing in here, we are getting an impression of what's happening and not the reality. But from the writings, uh, the more we read the writings, the more we understand. It's not a bad thing if at this moment in here um, or some other stage, because maybe we'll have more people in the afternoon, I will talk about this aspect of understanding. Uh, which is a very important aspect in our life. Um, maybe we'll leave that later on. Any other questions now? And if not, we will go to that subject. We we'll continue with it. Or are you tired now? What is the time? Quarter to 11. Do you want to give yourself five minutes of a break? Everybody wants five minutes of a break, and then we come back again. Uh, Friends, I feel we should now continue our s subject, but there, is there any other questions before I go on? There was a gentleman, a lady first, yes, you were first there, you remember in the back? Yes. 
Yes, the question is this, that if a child is born blind, for instance, and of course in this world he has missed an awful lot, uh, what happens to her soul? Isn't that what you're saying in the next slide? No? Oh, what we don't have, oh I see, yeah you mean to say that if we do not acquire certain qualities and perfections here and we said that we cannot get them in the next life, what will happen? Well again, I, I, again you see remember this, we cannot be, uh, we are not here going to be discussing this entirely on a rational basis and just say exactly what's going to happen. Uh, what we understand from the writings, that's all I can say, is that we must acquire these qualities and perfections in this life. This is the place for acquiring them. If we do not acquire them, we cannot get them in the next life. Uh, then there is a question here which we, will never, we must never uh, overlook. And it is the bounties of God. And the grace of God. And the forgiveness of God. That's another thing. These are all the elements which must be taken into consideration. We know a child, for instance, who has not had the, the, the opportunity to develop these qualities and perfections in this life, God will compensate it for him in the next life, through his bounties. I don't know how God will be deal with us if we have not acquired these qualities and perfections. We cannot be sort of in here sitting and giving a judgment and, and say this is exactly what's going to happen. One thing we know. And that is that forgiveness of God is very great. Very great indeed. You cannot underestimate the forgiveness of God. Um, I am sure myself in my thoughts, in my mind, this is my feeling, that God will forgive everybody. Now I'm not saying that God will um, immediately uh, put us all on the same level. Yeah, we will be in our own levels, but God is very forgiving. And all the th wrong things we do, um, God can and will forgive. Um, there are some things that He cannot forgive. I, I, I'll, I'll come. Up, I will discuss this later on. It is not something that He doesn't want to forgive, but He cannot. Uh, it's against the laws of creation, and one of those things I mentioned is this covenant breaking. But. Uh, Abdul Baha mentions if you do not educate your children properly, if you do not educate them, if you do not teach them uh, the law of God and the love of God, it's something which God cannot forgive. I don't know what it means, what, how he will deal with us. Um, there are few things that are unforgivable by God, but his forgiveness is very, very great. Uh, the ocean of his forgiveness is very immense but it must not become a license so that we can say alright now that God is forgiving let's go and have a jolly good time here you have to remember that uh, we have to acquire limbs and org spiritual qualities and perfections here this is the purpose of life you know speaking of God's forgiveness I'll tell you a little story just to amuse you a little bit it's just to amuse you <laughs> Uh, you know, they, they, uh, there was a very uh, great religious leader in, in the East, in Persia. And uh, one day God said to him, and he had a lot of followers. This man had a lot of followers. And uh, he was very proud of himself. He became proud a little bit. And God said to him, do you want me to... Uh, he said, I see you have a lot of followers, he said. I see you have a lot of followers, do you want me to, re to reveal to all your followers some of your bad qualities which you are hiding from them? And if I reveal all these bad qualities, all these followers will leave you. Do you want me to do that? He said. Uh, this man thought things are getting very bad. He decided to do a little bit of blackmailing. He said to God, do you want me to tell the people about the great ocean of your forgiveness? 
that you forgive everybody so that if they hear it nobody will worship you anymore and God thought this is getting very bad <laughs> he said we'll make a deal I won't <laughs> I won't reveal all your bad qualities and you don't talk so much about the ocean of my forgiveness <laughs> that's right so I think uh, it gives us an idea yes Sorry? Yeah, well, if you like, we can discuss this. I'll make a note of this question, and sometime we'll discuss it when we'll be dealing with the subject. Um, now, can I ask, you, you, you had a question on this point there? Uh, Yeah, all right. Yes, yes. You want to know what the fear of God is. Well, now look, I think we leave that subject also for later on. I'll make a note of these things. They'll come up a little bit later. These will uh, fit in better at the later stage. Uh, now, if there is no other questions, I think I'll go now and talk about this. And I'm not, uh, I, I suppose some of you have not heard the first part of this talk. And so I don't know what uh, you will uh, learn now or will listen now. But anyhow... Um, I, I'm not going to say what I have so far said but I feel that uh, it is essential to say this much that uh, we said that the soul uh, comes from the spiritual worlds of God it's an emanation from the worlds of God that it is here to acquire spiritual qualities and perfections so that in the next life it can use those qualities and perfections to enable him to progress and uh, we said that this seems to be the purpose of life but really this is not the essential purpose of life there is a far far greater purpose in life that God has created us for something far far greater than this he has not just created us to come into this world and acquire qualities and perfections alone he has created us for something far greater and in order to appreciate this I'm going to take you to nature again because I'm telling you this morning that nature will give us an awful lot of um, insight into spiritual things provided you read the writings in nature you will notice anything which grows which has an organic growth has a beginning and the beginning of it is when you put the seed down in the soil you put the seed down in the soil uh, the seed will germinate then there come a time, it's like again conception of a child, it's the same thing. The seed will germinate and then you have a little plant and then the plant grows and it becomes a tree. But now this tree, we can say it can only fulfill itself, fulfill the purpose for which this tree is created, is to give its fruit. When it gives its fruit, when it gives its seed, we'll say now it has fulfilled itself it has uh, carried out what it was created for uh, see everything has to begin has a beginning it grows it must give it fruit it must bring a child the soul is the same thing our soul has a beginning we said it this morning it has a time when it, the soul begins to grow in the first at the time of conception it grows and it acquires spiritual qualities just like the tree that is growing but uh, at a certain time and not immediately now it's the same way with the tree the tree cannot immediately come and give its fruit it has to reach an age of maturity like the seed is planted then it grows 
and acquires qualities and perfections. But at one point, at some point in his life, that soul must produce a child, must give birth to a child. The soul, I'm talking of the soul, which is a spiritual thing, must give birth to a fruit, a child. But as I said, it cannot produce it immediately. And in fact, there is a certain age for it, that it can begin to think in terms of producing a child. And uh, I'll mention the age later on. Now go back to nature again. You will find anything which produces a child is a female. A female species is what produces a child. And I, I hope that men would not mind me saying this. I think that females, the female is a much better, more complete form of creation than, than a male. You know that? Oh, you agree? <laughs> oh, there we are. Now men will be angry when I go out of this room. You must be protecting me, you know? I'll be, I'll be attacked. I'll be attacked. <laughs> you see, because a female can reproduce, can produce a fruit. But again, um, the tree cannot produce a, a fruit by itself. And we are just talking of nature. It has to be pollinated. A female cannot produce a child on her own. There must be a, a relationship with a male factor. So that the female can conceive a child. And then give birth to it. This is nature. This is the same thing with the soul. Our soul, which is a spiritual entity, if it has to produce a child, it cannot produce a child on her own. The soul here must act as a female and enter into partnership with another agency, with another uh, force. But the choice here is given to us. A tree has no choice. It's pollinated by nature. See? The animal has this mating with its own type. But we, but the soul here, has got a choice. It can, you can choose whatever agency, whatever force you want to give your soul to it and establish this marriage. It's like a marriage, really. Our soul, which is a spiritual thing. Now, I'll tell you what most people of the world do. Of course, most people even don't know they have a soul. They, they won't even think about it. But most people, without knowing it, they give their soul to this world. They're born here. They live so many years. They think of nothing but material things. Isn't that right? So what happens? They have given their soul to this world. And so the child of that soul, which is a spiritual entity, the child that it produces is not worthy of itself. It is materialism. Imagine our soul give birth to materialism. It's become darkened. There is a, a, a little bit of spiritual entity there. But that spiritual entity has given birth, has, has given itself to this world. Establish a relationship with this world. And the child of that product is very unworthy. See? Its father is very low. The mother is the soul. But the father is very unworthy. It's in material things. And so the child is materialism. Now, Baha'u'llah tells us, I'm, para I'm just giving you in this form of example, to whom we should give our soul in marriage, in relationship, with whom we should establish a relationship. We should establish a relationship between our souls and the forces of the revelation of Baha'u'llah. In other words, 
we give ourselves to the influences of the revelation of Baha'u'llah. We open our heart and our soul to the influences of his revelation. Can you imagine? A very much more exalted station than ourselves. The forces of the revelation which he has released in the world. We allow our souls to become fertilized by these forces which he has released. If you let it, because it's up to us. And when you open your heart to the influences of his revelation and let the forces of his revelation fertilize our souls, then our souls will conceive a child which is worthy. And that child, once it is born, it is known, you can call it, the spirit of faith. Our soul has produced the spirit of faith, which is a very, which is the purpose of life, the purpose of creation, the purpose that God has created us for. And Baha'u'llah says, if the station of that soul is revealed to the eyes of men, I'm paraphrasing his word, who has given birth to the spirit of faith, the whole of creation would, will be found dumbfounded. Someone who has given birth to the spirit of faith, someone who has said, I believe. When you say, I believe, what really has happened is that your soul and the revelation of Baha'u'llah as a result of this mystical intercourse has now produced a child. And you say, I believe. And that child is born. The spirit of faith is born. Now this is the station which God has destined for man. Which can overlook all the other qualities and perfections. Which can uh, over, not overlook, it can uh, really s dominate over all the other things that we have acquired. When you have the spirit of faith. You know, this lamp in here is lighting, is lighted. Before it was lighted, it was nothing. But when it is lighted, when you look at it, you can't see anything else but the light. It will dominate over all the things. In fact, if you closely look at it, you will see it's full of dust, probably. But you can't see the dust. It has completely overshadowed all the imperfections. Because it has become lighted. Um, of course, you come across beautiful, beautiful uh, chandeliers somewhere, hanging in someone's house. You come across beautiful people in this world, with great qualities and perfections. Really, who are not Baha'is. You come across great, great many people, who live a marvelous life. Much better than me, I'm sure. They are like as chandeliers, you know, like this beautiful uh, crystal lamp, which is exquisite. But it's not lighted. <laughs> this is an old little bulb or an old little lamp full of dust and full of all kinds of imperfections but it is connected that's lighted and that is the difference but the real thing to be is to be a chandelier which is lighted <laughs> that is the real purpose of life <laughs> to have the qualities and perfections and being exquisite qualities and perfections and also lighted that is the story of the early or, or the believers, the believers, both early and the present time. To acquire qualities and perfections and to have faith, to have the spirit of faith. Now, this faith, when it is born, when this child is born, we said the spirit of faith is the child which really our soul has given birth to. It has conceived it because, you know, it doesn't happen suddenly also. When you give yourself to the rev influences of the revelation of Baha'u'llah, it doesn't immediately appear as a spirit of faith. Just like a, mo just like a woman who becomes pregnant. 
doesn't immediately give birth to a child. There must be a period of conception, of growth, of that embryonic growth until it can be born. It takes time. But there comes a time that then you have no, you have so much sure of it that you have faith. And you say, I really believe. And you really believe in your heart. I also mentioned, you remember, that when the soul, when the tree comes into being, you remember we talked about a tree. It's first the, you, you plant the seed and then it grows. It doesn't immediately produce a fruit either. You have to wait until it becomes mature. It's the same thing with the soul. A soul cannot immediately recognize and give itself to Baha'u'llah. There is an age for it. There is at least a limit for it. That you have to produce that. And that is, you might say, the age of 15. That you uh, will become spiritually obliged to, to, to give, to carry out some of the teachings. Although before that, you are a Baha'i, naturally. A child is a Baha'i. But the, but the obligations uh, is not binding on you until you reach that particular age. Now having said this, that our soul must give birth to a child. Now let us look at nature again. In nature, when a mother gives birth to a child, that's, that, opera, that action of giving birth to, it may be relatively an easy action. Or maybe I shouldn't say that. To give birth to a child is easy. I shouldn't say that. But really, parents know that to give birth to a child is nothing comparing with the after, afterwards. After the child is born is the beginning of all the cares and the attention and the labors and the work that you have to do for that child to protect it constantly. All the time to protect it and help it to grow and mature. It's much more difficult. It's easy to become Baha'i. But it is difficult to grow. To protect the faith to enable it to grow day by day and to look after it and to watch over it much more difficult it needs a vigilance which is constant vigilance it has to be constant so that there we come across again a very new a new um, challenge which has come to us once you have faith a new challenge come to us I have said I am a Baha'i. What is the next step? So that my faith may grow. And remember, our faith is precious to us. Just as much a child is precious to a mother. And it's also precious to its father. And here is the forces of the revelation of Baha'u'llah. Baha'u'llah is attached very deeply to our faith. He loves a believer. He loves the faithful believer, the person who has faith. And his love for him is so great that we cannot ever measure it. The love that Baha'u'llah has for the believers, and the outpouring of his love is so great that we cannot visualize in this life. And the sorrow which floods the heart when one person is his heart when one person loses his faith or becomes weak in his faith it brings great sorrows to the heart of the manifestation of God. Such sorrows that are not, that are not comparable ever with all the sufferings which were heaped upon him by the enemies. That is nothing. The sufferings of the enemies is nothing. Uh, it means nothing to Baha'u'llah really. The physical sufferings. And he himself mentions. Uh, the suffering which comes to the manifestation of God is when one soul who has recognized him does one little thing which 
is an indication that he is not growing. Just like a father who sees his son is becoming ill. And he will see it. He notices. He becomes ill. And as soon as he becomes ill, he becomes worried. He becomes unhappy. One believer doing one thing against the faith brought so much sorrow to the heart of Baha'u'llah, to the heart of Abdul Baha, to the heart of Shoghi Effendi. That is beyond our estimation. And if ever one lost his faith, that would be just like a father who laments the passing of his child. His child is dead. Brings great sorrows to the person also. And to Baha'u'llah. I will give you a, an example of this, at least uh, not about Baha'u'llah, but I'll talk about Shoghi Effendi. You know, Shoghi Effendi was a very... He was very sensitive, a very sensitive soul, very sensitive heart. He was uh, the guardian of the cause. And you know, of course, uh, must have heard the name of Dorothy Baker, who was one of the hands of the cause, an American lady. And she, of course, um, was involved in a fatal accident where she, she, she was traveling in this comet, which was the, one of the first, was the first jet airliner which the British made. And uh, the comet exploded in the air. It wasn't really fully uh, tested. And uh, she, uh, she, was, she was killed. Well, one of the pilgrims was telling us a story. Uh, she was present at the time that the news of the, of the passing on this tragic form of Dorothy Baker was brought to Shoghi Effendi. And Shoghi Effendi was sad and uh, he began to talk about her services and uh, spoke about her for some time that evening and then changed the subject and carried on carried on and after all this person has passed away then a few days later the news reached Shoghi Effendi that one young girl who was a believer has been with some tricks and some uh, plottings has been taken into the company of the covenant breakers and has joined in marriage with one of them. Now that person is gone, is like a child, like a soul which is dead now, you know the faith is what I was talking to you about, the faith is gone, is lost. The sorrows which flooded the heart of Shoghi Effendi as a result of this 15 year old girl was so great that for some days he could not come out of his bed and he was so uh, crippled really with this blow but look the death of a, of, a, of a hand of the cause was only 15 minutes it passed by nothing after all she had ascended to the realms beyond but the um, defection of this girl losing her faith dealt such a deadly blow upon him that he could not come and meet with the friends for one or two days. Now this shows how much our faith is, is, is really uh, precious to God, to the manifestation of God and to his disciples, and to, and to Abdul Baha, and to Shoghi Effendi. Well now, we wanted to find out what should we do now. We have just given birth to the spirit of faith. Just like a mother who has birth, given birth to a child. What are we going to do with it now? To enable it to grow. This again we can learn from nature. You want to say something? Can I get the point on when we're talking about giving birth? Are we talking in a very black and white time when a person becomes a Baha'i? Yes, yes, yes. The soul has just given birth to faith. 
and uh, he has given himself to Baha'u'llah really and as a result of it he says I believe that is when the first spark of faith appears in our hearts just like a mother who has given birth to a child this is just a form of looking at nature to see what happens there now when you look at nature you will find that the mother who gives birth to a child the first thing she does if you notice she loves that child very much and the next thing she does she will feed the child and the child has never been fed before in his life never tasted the, the milk and none of us can remember what it was like when we first received the milk from our mother but it must have been some it must have some effect on us on the child it gets a taste for it and the next time it probably wants uh, it's not going to reject it it becomes more and more fond of that milk to such an extent that it will cry for it afterwards and he wants to drink this milk and this milk make it grow this is nature and the mother will feed the child regularly regularly now the same thing applies exactly to our faith when you say I become a Baha'i it's a dangerous thing to remain like this and just remain in that state you must we must feed our, our faith we must feed the spirit of faith which is born we must feed it with some food and the food for it is the words of God for this age this is why Baha'u'llah has commanded us this is one of his commandments he says you must read you must recite he says recite my words recite my words twice a day in the morning and in the evening he, spe he stipulates that recite my words in the morning and in the evening it's just like a mother who says to her child eat your food two or three times a day you see how similar it is and Baha'u'llah mentions to us if we don't recite what will happen to us you can imagine what will happen to us what will happen if a child does not eat his food Baha'u'llah says if you do not read my words it's a very serious situation he says you are not steadfast in the covenant uh, our soul if it is to be healthy it must be steadfast in the covenant if it is not it's a serious um, situation and this is when the believer becomes confused he's a Baha'i yes but he has never taken a food or very little and so he becomes frustrated he cannot see joy out of his faith and out of life just like a person who does not eat his food I remember a few years ago one young person came to me and he said you know he said it's one year that I'm a Baha'i but I don't feel any difference I'm the same person as before can you imagine when you become a Baha'i can you imagine what happens we we have to be different one has to be very different very different it's a new it's a new life this is the second birth that Christ is talking about the spirit of faith is born it must be the most exciting thing which happens just like an excitement which comes to a mother there is no excitement in the world for a mother greater than to have given birth to a child and this person said well <laughs> I don't feel any excitement I'm a Baha'i for a year but I've not grown I've not changed I'm just like the old days uh, I'm not excited about anything what is wrong with me he said well you can imagine what's wrong you know um, I mentioned to him I said have you ever loved somebody uh, because you must remember the faith you cannot you cannot only become a Baha'i through your intellectual um, 
appraisal and intellectual investigations. You might begin with that way. But you have to fall in love, really. Your heart must accept the faith. You must fall in love. It's a falling in love. To be a Baha'i is that you have fallen in love. And of course this is a relative term. It varies from person to person. One person's love for Baha'u'llah is uh, not much of a love for another. in another case of another person. Everyone is in different levels. We are all in different levels. This is a relative term. But to be a Baha'i means that you have come to love Baha'u'llah. This is what it amounts to. You can understand it, yes, you must study it and everything else. I don't know how you become a Baha'i, it's not important. You might become a Baha'i through a purely an intellectual approach. But then, if, you, if your heart does not um, move, and if your heart does not um, fall in love, because I mentioned, we have to give ourselves to, we have to give our soul to the influences of the revelation of Baha'u'llah. It's a, it is just like a marriage. When you are marrying somebody, you love that person. You see? Now here it is. I, this, ja this young man was telling me, he said that after a year, I don't feel any difference. I said, Did you ever have you ever loved anybody in your life? He said, yes. Now let us see what happened that you love this person. Really, let us examine it. This is nature again. What happens that you come to love somebody? The first thing, you meet that person. Isn't that right? And when you meet that person, you like that person. And when you like that person, you come a little closer to that person. Isn't that right? You come a little closer. And when you come a little closer, you like him more or like her more. And when you like her more, you come still further closer. And you come closer and closer and closer. And it comes a point that uh, you want to see you want to know everything about that person. Isn't that right? You want to know everything. And you're going to ask even people, what is this? Tell me all about. It. And I'm sure if somebody rings you up in the middle of night, two in the morning and say, look, I've got some news for you about your friend. Would you like me to tell you? Oh yes, please tell me. You're not tired of it. You become excited. You see, you are beginning to fall in love with somebody. Oh. And so, this is how you fall in love with some person. So I mentioned to this young man, I said, when you heard of Baha'u'llah and recognized him and said you are a Baha'i, did you ever come a little closer to him? To Baha'u'llah? Did you ever allow yourself to come a little closer to him? No. Did you ever read anything about the history of his revelation, really, to find out what was going on in, his, in all this... Did you try to find out anything about him? No. Did you read any of his writings? No. Did you care to carry out his teachings? Exactly. See, what he has said, let me carry them out. No, he said. Well, what do you expect? You have kept your distance. And now you want to be uh, different. Of course you're not. You're the same person. You're just like a mother who has given birth to a child somehow. But it's gone now. It's not there anymore. It's very little of it left. And this is why I said it's very easy to become a Baha'i. But to grow in the faith is the greatest challenge and the greatest uh, difficulty. But we can learn. We can learn from nature and we can learn from the writings of Baha'u'llah. And as I said in the morning, everything that he has said, it fits into nature. Now this very teaching that he tells us, this very commandment, that he tells us we must read his words twice a day, in the morning and in the evening is just as vital as eating the food for a child. And you see how much similar it is to nature when he says do it twice a day. <coughs> you know in life it's the same thing. If you eat, you, you cannot lump together all your food and eat it once a day. You can't do that. It's not healthy. You eat something in the morning then that's something that you eat in the morning, you have to give it time to be digested. And when it is digested, then you become hungry again. And it is a sign of digestion is that you have, you're hungry again. Then you will eat again. Baha'u'llah has given us the same commandment. He says, read my words in the morning, 
which means when you read it you mustn't just read it and forget it but rather allow it to penetrate into our hearts penetrate into our hearts and uh, and when it penetrates in the heart then the sign of it penetrating in our hearts what we read is that when we come home in the evening you are eager to read again of the writings this is the sign if I come home and I'm not eager to read it means what I have read in the morning or if I have read it what I have read in the morning have not penetrated into my heart and there is again a challenge what are we going to do? How are we going to enable the words of Baha'u'llah to penetrate into our soul? And now what I'm trying to tell you in a way is this. That in life you have to do so many things to live in order to enable you to live. Isn't that right? In life you can't just say alright I'm going to eat only. And then I'm going to live. No, no, you can't do that. You have to do so many things to enable you to live in this life. You have to eat, you have to sleep, you can't do without it. You have to breathe air into your lungs, you have to wash, you have to dress, you have to go shopping, you have to work, you have to have friends if you want to live. You have to do all these things. And if one of them is not done, if I say, I'm not going to shopping ever. I only can't live real. You must go for shopping. You have to do all these things. It's like in electricity. It's like, you know, these switches which are in series. If you put a lot of, a number of switches, one after the other, you must close all the switches so that the current may flow. If one of them is open, nothing will happen it's the same thing in the faith you become a Baha'i now the, war, the task begins you have to close switch after switch in order that you may live happily and grow our faith may grow and one of them the first one was this reading of the writings in the morning and in the evening it is such an important commandment that n nobody can ever emphasize this point enough how important it is to make it a habit for ourselves to read the writings and you know to form a habit is difficult when you are grown up or when you become a Baha'i you've never been reading the writings before so to, to form a habit is difficult it's alright for children to learn it a child will learn it and make a habit of it but to read the writings when you are grown up you have to force yourself at first until it becomes a second habit and it doesn't matter you must we must not be worried about it if we once there is a lapse in this you may do it for a week and then you forget it doesn't matter try it again you forgot it for another week okay doesn't matter God is forgiving of course it is you just take one little step forward he comes to you a thousand meters doesn't matter do it again so that it becomes a habit so that the goal of a Baha'i really is to become an addict to the writings of Baha'u'llah this is the goal and you know how you become an addict now you must know or must have heard of I don't think you're addicts yourselves to anything but people who become addicts to drugs what happens to them is somebody introduces the idea to them and eventually give them a little piece to try the child becomes an addict to the milk of the mother. And we have to become an addict to the writings of Baha'u'llah. And I will probably in the course of news, next sessions, we'll talk about it. Of how should we read the words so that we may become really addicts to it. Now, I think when they are children, children can learn this when they are young. And we should teach our children from childhood to make it a habit of reading the writings in the morning and in the evening then they grow and it becomes natural for them now there is one point that I must mention here it's a very important point what is the writing? 
We must not mix it with prayers here. We are not talking of prayers. Prayers are different things. We do it differently and I'm not going to talk about it now. Prayer plays a very important part in our life. But reading the writings of Baha'u'llah is very different thing altogether. The writings are those things that you come across in English now. Many of these writings are available to us. The gleanings, book of gleanings is full of the writings of Baha'u'llah. The tablets of Baha'u'llah lately published by the House of Justice. These are the writings of Baha'u'llah. There are other books which are not prayers of the writings. The hidden words is one of the writings of Baha'u'llah. And there is a vast difference between writing, reading the writings and saying prayers. In fact, these two things are sometimes opposite things. Very opposite. A prayer and a, a tablet of Baha'u'llah are opposite things. I will explain to you how. When you say a prayer, you often ask God for something. But when you read the writings, it's God who asks you to do something. It's very different. You see how different it is? And we have to be differentiating this very clearly in our minds. And especially if you are teaching our children. I note that the children of all the Baha'i families, they are taught prayers. You know, most children learn prayers. But we should have a program every home where we can see that and show the children the difference between reading the writings and saying your prayers. You could say, all right, say a prayer, but let us now read the writings and pick up something for them which they can read so that it becomes a habit for them and they can distinguish between the two things. In our meetings, well, this is my own taste now, if you like call it. This is just a taste, personal taste. I feel we should say prayers, but equally we should read the writings when we gather together in a meeting. When we have a devotional program, you can say prayers, you can read the writings. Now, Baha'u'llah has again here applied the same laws of nature to this particular commandment by telling us that we must not read the writings when we are tired. He says, read as much as you are enjoying it. As soon as you become tired, don't read it. Do you know what it is like? It's like a mother who says to her child, eat your food as long as you are hungry. As soon as you are full, stop eating. This is it. You see, very natural. All these teachings, as I said, have their origin in nature. Now, we must also, I'm, I'm going to, the time is coming 12 o'clock, I think I'm going to tell you a story. There's much we, can, we have to cover in this field, we haven't even touched upon this properly, of all the things we have to do. As I said, there are a lot of switches we have to close in, in order that we can ena enable our souls to experience that growth and that joy of faith. A growing faith, not a static faith. A static faith for a Baha'i is fatal. You know, something which is always the same. <laughs> but he says we must allow our faith to grow day by day. And we must feel it just like a mother who feels that his child is growing. And he's happy for it. Now I'm going to tell you a story, which is a true story. Now I don't think it's made up. It relates to one of the early believers of Baha'u'llah. Now this is a very well-known, one of the well-known apostles of Baha'u'llah. He's one of the apostles of Baha'u'llah was called Zainul Mugharrabin. It doesn't matter now the name to you. He was one of the outstanding disciples of Baha'u'llah. One who really had a great, great um, qualities of knowledge and learning. And his uh, particular work was, at one stage in his life, was to transcribe the writings. You know, transcribing the writings was a very important task. Because when revelation came to Baha'u'llah and this amanuensis would write it very fast, so fast that you cannot read it. Revelation writings, you can look at revelation writings, it's, it's, it's not possible to read it. The way revelation came to him was so fast 
uh, and there is no shorthand in Persian or Arabic languages. That is, amanuenses had to, had to use a, s a special technique of writing them. 